How to Meet a Lover Online by M. N. Malone Performed by Otis Jiry. I met David online. He was a member of a number of interest groups, a avid practitioner of male metrosexual fashion, a kayaking enthusiast, a coin collector, and a racquetball player. He hailed from the Midwest, having a master's in creative writing, and enjoyed visiting the bar scene on the weekends. I could have met David through any one of these many facets of his personality, could have bumped into him among the throng of stalls at a flea market, or in the thumping, neon-lit enclosure of a club. I could have seen him at an amateur poetry reading in the art store on Main Street on a cold Tuesday morning, or caught his gaze in one of the local parks as he readied for a day of paddling and sightseeing in the dead of summer. I could have, but I didn't. No, I met David online, on a board for local gay men. That's when I knew he was the one I'd been looking for. I'm not a young man, not like David, where he is in his late twenties. I'm nearly thirty years his senior, where his body seems carefully carved like a brassy statue, limbed by an inner glow, mine is creased, sagging, and fragile. He wears a close-cropped beard, full and dark, but I am clean-shaven. His hair is carefully and fashionably attended to, short on the sides, long on the top, a dab of molding wax to seize it at the side, but mine is long, thin, and starched. Never was there such a contrast as us, young and old, beautiful and mundane, but I knew I wanted him all the same. The beauty of such a connection as mine and David's is that, should he have decided to decline my offer of a meeting, it would have hardly broken my heart. We would have simply passed by each other along our own paths, never faded across, and we would have faded into each other's histories, little more than footnotes. After all, the web affords a spectrum of anonymity unheard of until its advent, and it is a dial that one is more than able to adjust with each new face upon the screen. It would be a lie to say I wasn't nervous. After all, it was to be my first time with a man, and rejection, anonymous or not, always stings. But I would have continued my search for someone like David, even if it couldn't properly be him. Driven by this, I carefully worded a direct message, and, having guessed his schedule based on his post history, sent it when I thought he might be most active. As luck would have it, there was a reply in my inbox not fifteen minutes later, and we began to speak. David and I arranged our meeting for the next week. Some may think I would be cowardly in my approach. After all, I distinguished him before as something of a god something beautiful, something extraordinary. But for his sake, as well as mine, I was as honest as could be. He knew my age from the first message I sent him. He knew my occupation and my first name. I even sent him a picture, albeit one taken a year or so prior. David knew all that he needed to know to understand, at least foundationally, who I was. Honesty and integrity were core to what I wanted from David, paramount, even. To pretend to be something I am not would be to ruin my own needs altogether. We messaged very little in the week leading up to our meeting. It's not that I didn't want to speak to David. No, I wanted nothing more. But I felt as though I needed to save the conversation. I wanted to hear him speak to me. I wanted to watch the way his lips formed the words, the way his teeth flashed, the way his hands moved to support the gravity of his sentences. I could almost picture it in my head, and when I did, my mind was flooded with that strange mixture of anxiety and happiness that only intimate plans can bring. I often thought of my youth when that happened of how wrong my father and mother would think it to have relations with a man, how disgusted all of those boys from my school would have been. Indeed, even if I had spent fifty years of my life carefully treading the right side of the line, 
burying myself between the thighs of women and loving them as best I could. But David had affirmed in me that there was something more than what I'd known and what I'd done. It felt good to cut against the grain that had been instilled in me. It felt freeing. And at my age, one can't put a price on that fleeting sense of being given a choice and choosing wrong. David and I met at Café on Elm. I spotted him from the street, sitting in the patio section. With a wave of his hand, he signaled me, and I approached, taking the iron-backed chair opposite. He wore a gray suit, slightly rumpled, and a purple undershirt that contrasted with the orange glow of his skin as the sun burned into the buildings. The curve of his spine was supple, more effeminate than in the pictures I'd seen. His hands were slender and calloused. It was divine. I ordered a bowl of Turin, David a BLT with a side of French fries, crinkle cut. We each had a glass of Pinot Grigio and talked as we waited for our food to arrive. I told David about my early life, the boarding school, the summer trips to Scotland with my aunt, my mother and father's subsequent divorce. I skimmed over my employment at college as an adjunct nursing professor and my move into the position of office work to get away from the bustle of classrooms. I even covered my brief marriage, a year with a woman named Margaret, who eventually left me to move to California with another man. David smiled when appropriate and at other times offered consolation. He was perfectly attentive. By the time I'd finished, our food had arrived, and David and I had moved our chairs subtly closer to one another. He carefully plucked the toothpick from his sandwich and began to eat. I watched, and then remembered myself and dug in. At one point, David paused, wiped his mouth with the edge of the napkin, and spoke. So, have you, have you ever been with someone like... He paused, chewing on his words. Have you ever been with someone like this before? I was caught off guard. In all honesty, I hadn't anticipated him asking. Suddenly, the anxiety overrode the happiness. Um, I haven't. This is a first for me as well. If we're being honest, I've always wanted to do this, but I've never felt comfortable. But now, I don't have so much of a reputation to uphold or people to impress. I can do what I want, I think, if that makes sense. David just smiled and nodded. Well, I'm happy for you, too. If I'm not being too pressing, would you mind another question? I shook my head no. Does my age bother you? I mean, I don't want to be rude, but you are a bit older than I am. Does that seem strange at all? It was my turn to smile. Absolutely not. In fact, I find it flattering. David beamed. There was a reaffirming warmth to it, a proof that we had reached some level in our relationship already, where we could talk man to man about what we wanted, what we needed. I took the chance to urge him to tell me more about himself. He happily agreed. When we had finished our dinner, David and I rose from our seats and walked to our cars. Despite the cool evening settling in, I felt a heat around my neck as we stood on the sidewalk next to his Lexus. He wasn't saying anything, just standing and stroking his chin. I took it as a sign. David, would you mind? I, I mean... Would you like to come back to my place? There was silence at first, but then a boyish smile broke across his face. Absolutely. The heat didn't dissipate, even as I drove. We arrived at my home almost a half hour later. It is by no means big, but it is passably large, artfully decorated, and, above all, sequestered on a small parcel of land at the city limits. I parked my car, and David parked his, and together we made our way into the house. I had saved a bottle of Riesling for the occasion, and turned on the lights, poured a couple of glasses, and moved into the living room with David on my heels. Out of the public eye, he was more affectionate, 
light touches on my back and my hip as he moved around me, a twinkle in his eye and a suggestive tone to his words. He took a seat on my couch, the black leather folding underneath his weight with the slightest sound, and I took to the nearest chair. We talked for hours, taking turns elaborating and asking questions. We talked of life again, we talked of goals, but mostly we talked of desires. The more I drank, the more that I began to notice the way he looked at me. Wanting. Hungry. He didn't say it, but in his words there was a question. The question. After I downed my third glass, I moved to his side on the couch. There was hardly a breath before our mouths met. He tasted of apples, his tongue sweet and teasing. I took the lead and pressed my hand to the back of his head. Breaking off, I planted kisses along his cheek against his ear and trailed down his jawline. I let my tongue lead when it wanted and felt his body tense and ease in rising passion. My fingers found the buttons of his suit jacket and those of his dress shirt in beneath. His chest bare, I trailed further down and I felt his hands run through my hair and urge me forward. I paused along the top of his pants, teething lightly at the edge, and felt him instinctively push his legs wider. My hands fumbled with his belt and then the button hidden beneath. Then carefully I pulled them away. A single glance upward, a meeting of our eyes, reaffirmed his trust. I took him in my mouth. It was soft at first and slow, but the movement of hips urged, pleaded for more. I brought my teeth down harder and harder around the base with each thrust, and he slowed to accommodate. He moaned in ecstasy, his body shaking, and I pushed on. As the skin broke, I felt a rush of blood, and David's body tensed and then eased with it. His hands pushed me down further, shakily. I clenched my teeth tight, severing what remained and slowly pulled my head away. David was sweating and wincing, but his face said all there was to say about his pleasure. I chewed and swallowed. His body heaved. He raised his thumb and carefully traced the outline of my mouth. As before, I took it in and pressed my teeth down. It was harder than before. The bone crunched beneath my teeth, snapping as I tugged. I tasted salt and copper on my tongue. David moaned, but it was not a painful moan, and I felt the chewy extents of his muscles give way. This I did not eat. This I did not swallow. This I plucked free and saved for later. David did not die, if that's what you're thinking. Not then, at least. We had, of course, prepared for this, and time was of the essence. Cauterization is painful, especially when done correctly. But even through the pain, there was this glow from David, the glow of gratification. I could feel it, too, radiating from myself, burning in my stomach. When he was safe, lotioned and bandaged, I laid my head on his shoulder. David was still panting, and while his face was a mixture of sour pain, he sighed as contentedly as any lover. Was it good for you? I nodded. And you? Amazing. David moved in afterward, telling most others that he was leaving the area. No one questioned him. Everyone knew he was the adventurous type. He was still active on his own, and I still continued my work, but when we felt the need to consummate, we did so as we pleased. There came a time, though, when David knew that the end was nearing, and I saw it in the way his body dwindled. His fingers reduced to stubs, his skin marked by the burns that saved his life. There came a day where we sat at the kitchen table and spoke in hush whispers, despite being entirely alone. He told me he wasn't scared. I told him it would be another adventure. Afterward, he severed the final means of contact he had with the world. 
I ate David for months. Steak, soups, and all manner of dishes. I prepared him for every meal in some way. With each meal, I relived the experience. David was beautiful. David was amazing. David was delicious. David was my first, but he was not my last. In what has nearly been a decade since his death, I have had and seized the opportunity two more times. Each time it was gratifying. Each time my partner felt as much ecstasy as I up until the end. But none had ever compared to David. None ever can. I met David online, and we opened each other's worlds to new and expansive horizons. I had never taken another man's life. I never have. But I have been given three lives, and I have cherished them all. Which leads me to the reason I am writing this. I am a man whose lust has been sated, but who is still incomplete. I am a man who has been frivolous and dangerous, and has thrived because of it. I know now that I can die with no regrets. But can you say the same? I met David online. That's when I knew he was what I had been looking for. My name is Richard, and now you have met me. I want to meet you in person, and we can go from there, piece by piece. Thanks for listening. The story you've just heard in this channel are fan-funded. Visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com today to become a patron and help us bring radio theater back from the dead. Just click support us, choose an amount you're comfortable with, and become a part of our family today. Just $2 per month gets you immediate access to our patrons area. There, you'll find advanced new releases, our incredible archive of over 300 hours of productions, plus never-before-heard bonus material. Best of all, it's totally ad-free and in HD MP3 format. You get insider updates from our production team, the secret stash of streaming downloadable HD indie films, and you get to experience our patrons only one-on-one -on -one live events, putting you up close and personal with your favorite performers, unscripted and unrehearsed. All of this and more is yours today. And all you have to do is choose your level of support. Go to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com now and join us as we turn off the lights and turn on the dark.